Hi. Hi. Hello. Um, we're going to be doing this thing where we interview different individuals who have struggled with eating disorders. I just stuttered. <laughs> it's a hard word to Let's say. Let's get to it. <laughs> disorders. <laughs> disorders. Eating it's okay. disorders. This week. We have the gorgeous, hilarious, mm. multi-talented, brilliant Jonathan Slavin. <laughs> Thank you for pronouncing it as it was intended. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know Jonathan from Better Off Ted. Better Off Ted, yeah, yeah. Dr. Ken, mm -hmm. Speechless, all sorts of other stuff. Didn't you play a demon on a witch show? Oh, I was on the Grimm show. I was a demon on that. Yeah, Check yeah. it out. I, was, I cried a lot as a demon. Oh, but beautiful. I, but it was like fake crying, so it was really Don't evil. Don't reveal your secrets. No, the character was fake crying. Oh, I yeah. see, I see. Mm -hmm. So Jonathan. Then, tell Absolutely. us about your eating disorder. <laughs> this is uh, this is the first one of these I've done. I'm pretty <laughs> out with my disorders, but um, I have dabbled oh. in sort of the three big ones. Mm -hmm. The ABCs, as we call them, the anorexia, bulimia, and the compulsive overeating. The ABCs of eating disorders. Yeah. Oh, you should patent that. <laughs> That's I beautiful. feel like someone else might have thought of that. Oh. But let's, uh, let's this is my idea. Yeah, this started, he um, owns it now. Yes, uh, um, restricting is like my number one. Mm -hmm. When I was a teenager, uh, bulimia was my was more my number one though. Mm -hmm. And then compulsive overeating is like, uh, came in very concentrated periods of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. How fun. They're really fun. Yeah. And, but they are all kind of, they're sort of all the same and all different. Mm -hmm. For me, like bulimia and compulsive overeating, I felt really out of control with those things. But anorexia, I felt super in control. Mm -hmm. So it like required me to reframe. I was like, I'm so powerful, I'm not even hungry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, which you're just as out of control. Like you're, I mean, you know, like you're yeah. just as crazy and out of control with that. But that's, um, if I may, you may quote. Do you know that like Lord Byron had an eating disorder? No. Um, he did, and he called it. I'm going to get the quote wrong, but it's the disease that flatters and lies, ah. and that feels very appropriate, specifically for anorexia, because mm -hmm. you go like, I'm super in control of this, and you're just crazy, yeah, and out of control. No, I really remember when I was anorexic at the very beginning, feeling so powerful yeah. and like above everyone. Yeah. It kind of like warps your brain. Totally. To doing oh, you like still need to things. eat. Yeah, I yeah. don't need to do that. No. It's fine. You, yeah, you normal people. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally, totally. <laughs> do you ever feel excluded from the eating disorder conversation because you're male? Hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, it's better now than it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm 48, and I uh, began my journey into eating disorders when I was 14. And then the only things that I could find, the only resources I found that even came close to naming what I had, were all about. Uh, teenage girls, and it was very confusing. Um, also, I mean, being gay and being told that I was feminine, like that helped <laughs> somehow make sense of it. Um, but in another way, it became even more shameful because uh, when you're like a, a closeted gay teenager in a small town, you you definitely don't want to have a disorder that you're told only affects women. Uh. So it was it was just it was very baffling mm -hmm. for me. Do you feel like having to be closeted contributed to your eating disorder or fed it in any way? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Because um, what's hard to explain about withholding that part of yourself, it means you lie in almost every conversation you have. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I grew up in a really tiny town in northeastern Pennsylvania. And so like when your friends talk about Duran Duran and you think they're cute too, you lie. And and it's like, so people always go like, why is that such a big deal? And it's because by removing that part, you remove so much of your own ability to have a, an honest dialogue with anyone about anything. If you think about it, like just taking out who you love, like from every conversation, mm -hmm. it's very isolating. Um, and I was round mm -hmm. when I was younger and there was a part of me that thought that if I wasn't, I would fit better. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's also, there's always going to be a part of me that feels like I take up too much space and I need to take up less space. And that is a real pathway to that. That is a theme that we have heard over and over again in working on the show. That's something that I relate to really personally, feeling like if I'm smaller, I'm less embarrassing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, there's like this, the picture that we have in our head of like, I always like feel like I'm like sort of huge and I breathe strangely <laughs> and there's like probably like a sticky <laughs> well, orange you do juice stain. Very strangely. <laughs> but I mean I do. Yeah, yeah. you should stop there's drinking like a fly orange juice. <laughs> buzzing around me like cuz I'm 
filthy, even though I shower 90 times a day. Like it's like, mm -hmm. it's just this idea of like this golem that I, I kind of carry around with me. And you know, it's loud. It's a loud idea. You have to, you have to really actively work to be like reality check. Yeah. What are the best ways you've learned to deal with Gollum? <laughs> um, you know, I have to insert other people's voices um, because I have learned over the years that I can't really trust my own all the time. And that's just part of my recovery. I definitely think there are people who learn to trust their own voices. But for me, it's the people that have helped me in my recovery. Like I hear them saying things to me. It can be something simple such as, is it okay to mention food? Yeah, 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 of so, course. So like, um, you know, when I'm panicking about the carbs in quinoa, mm -hmm. I can hear like a therapist that I went to saying to me like, you're morbidly obese because you eat too much quinoa, said no doctor to <laughs> anyone ever. So like, you know what I mean? So yeah. like, and that sort of shuts it down. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm pr I can be pretty hard on on that voice too. You know, that, that helps me to be like, you're being stupid, you're being an idiot, like shut, like mm -hmm. I have to be pretty strict with it or it can get, it can get real loud. Yeah. Do you find that there is pressure being a member of the gay community to fit into a certain... Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, like, I'm not indicting the gay community mm -hmm. because I love the gay community and there's there are aspects of it that I love. It is, to me, it's the only minority that, like, you grow up and you think, like, someday I will go and find my people. Mm -hmm. um, Justin. We should start over. From the beginning. Yeah. Welcome. Um, Hello. The gay community. I love the gay community. Mm -hmm. But I think if you grow up in any minority and you are one of the only people in that minority where you live, you have this idea that someday I will go find people like me and they will embrace me. And I think that largely that is true about other minorities. But in the gay community, if you are not hot, that is not true. It is sort of like uh, when I hear my women friends talk about how they feel at a frat party, mm -hmm. that is what being like a homely gay person feels like mm. with your own people. There is such a level of judgment and perfectionism. You know, I think the eating disorders in the gay community are like incredibly undiagnosed. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, you can see these boys running up and down Santa Monica Boulevard, yeah. you know, holding hand weights, running to the point of exhaustion and yeah. doing CrossFit to the point of serious injury. And it's because we have this standard of beauty and youth and abs mm -hmm. that we sort of require. And it can, it can be further isolating to be outside of that. Yeah. What do you wish that people knew about men who struggle with eating disorders? I wish, uh, first and foremost, that they knew that we exist because this disease depends on silence. And also I, I wish that people, it reminds me a little bit of like, um, I'm very old. And so like, but like- You're when, not very old. I am old. very old, but like when Jonathan's people, 96. I am. But like uh, when AIDS was first around, uh, a lot of people lied about what they had because there was such a stigma attached to it. And this feels sort of similar to that. There's this stigma attached that it's a female thing. It's just something only women get and that's, that therefore makes it shameful for men because men are a little bit misogynistic and we don't want to be connected to that. But also, if you think about it, like men get breast cancer and no one kind of titters silently when men get breast cancer. They go, oh my God, you have cancer. Like, how do we treat this? How do we support you? How do we help you? And if this could just be the same thing. Disease does not discriminate. It does not discriminate. This is a disease. Mm -hmm. What would you say to young Jonathan? Baby Jonathan. <laughs> Baby Jonathan. I would say um, you're going to live through this because I think there were moments when I didn't know that I would. You know, it's hard because anything that I say that would change this is gonna sound so weird, but I'm sort of, I'm, I'm sort of grateful that my sickness is part of my life because it has shaped who I am. I think it's given me an empathy that I wouldn't have had otherwise. It's given me an ability to examine my behavior that I might not have had. So I wouldn't say anything to baby Jonathan to change his path. I would just let him know that like, it was going to be a worthwhile path in mm. the long run, even though it's really, really excruciatingly painful. And he's sometimes very, very hungry. Yeah. <laughs> Poor baby Jonathan. Poor baby Jonathan. But he's gonna be okay. He quit eating apricots when he was uh, 12 because he told God that if God would make him not be gay, that he would give up his favorite food. 
so he quit eating apricots. I think it's interesting that like even my like my deal with God about my sexuality was food based. Yeah. Do you think there's any kind of like self punishment happening there? Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. Like I'm not I mean, worthy of food. Yeah, food like like definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think for a lot of us, we eat it knowing that we're going to feel badly about it. We mm -hmm. like we we absolutely beat the shit out of ourselves with with food. Yeah. How do you navigate staying healthy with with your brain and mm -hmm. with your eating disorder while being vegan? Oh, interestingly, a lot of the things that I could see myself mindlessly eating are now off the table because um, I'm an ethical vegan. Mm -hmm. I try to be healthy or whatever that my definition of that currently is, yeah. but like, um, but I am an ethical vegan. So I don't eat uh, meat and milk and dairy and uh, eggs because I think that they're, I, I don't like the practices around them. So like if there's a delicious cake that would be hard for someone to resist, it's not at all hard for me to resist because I know what goes into it. In that way, my veganism has been very healthy. Mm -hmm. I have also used my veganism really negatively to uh, get into some super restrictive behaviors. Mm -hmm. And so I have to be very careful with that. It's diligence. It's like diabetes for me. It's like, it's like I have to always be like checking my blood sugar and mm -hmm. shoot it. Like, it's like, that's what my eating disorder feels like to me. Yeah. Um, I know for lots of people, recovery feels easier than that. So I don't think that like anyone watching this would think that like you have a life of diligence ahead of you because that's not true for everyone. But for me, it has been up to this point. Mm -hmm. What have you done in terms of treatment? I very much wish that uh, when I was younger and I was forming these neural pathways that there was, that this wasn't a secret, that this wasn't something that boys didn't get, that this behavior was recognized. It's not my parents' fault. I mean, they caught me making myself throw up, but you know, they just didn't, they didn't recognize it for what it was. And so it was sort of like, we're going to like listen to the bathroom door and I know that they're out there. So I have to alter my behavior and I wish that there had been some food treatment mm -hmm. later in life when it just kept coming back up and it just kept coming back up. I've done some 12 step stuff and a lot of therapy, mm -hmm. a lot of individual therapy mm -hmm. and a little bit of group stuff. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I mean, <laughs> I'm a work in progress. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Do you eat apricots now? I eat as many apricots as I want and it's apricots Yuri. How do we teach young men to love their bodies when Henry Cavill, Cavill, Cavill. however you say it, Cavill, and all those right? Hemsworths are prancing around? You know, that's a really interesting question. I'm going, I'm going to get to it, mm -hmm. but like, and I don't know what their practice is. Mm -hmm. I have a trainer. I don't have him right now because I'm not in a series and I can't afford it. But when I'm on a series, I sometimes work with a trainer who's a great guy and understands how to work with me and my disorder and all that stuff. I learned that most of the bodies that I see at the gym and want to emulate are chemically enhanced. And that was something that I never knew. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that until right now. And so, yeah. I mean like, I go, okay, I really am not willing to shoot myself up with anything or to take, there's like a children's asthma medic. I mean like, it's oh like the stuff that people are taking yeah. that I'm not at all, I'm just not willing to do that. Yeah. When you have a job, like uh, remember Charlie's Angels? Oh yeah. So like the three women who played that, they had a job to be able to kick ass. Mm -hmm. And so they trained eight to 10 hours a day for that job. If you said to them now, climb that fence, do the parkour and kick ass, they would have to go back and retrain. Right. They don't do that all the time. And I think it's the same for a lot of these guys that we see is, you know, Hugh Jackman knows he's got a Wolverine coming up. He trains for that role. And then when that role is over, he lets it go. Mm. Those things that you see are not sustainable. And for me, the word for like the recovery to me begins and ends with, is this sustainable? Mm. Because I can do anything for a month, mm -hmm. but if I can look and go, yeah, down a timeline, I can see myself exercising in this way and eating in this way. And that makes sense. That's recovery to me. Yeah. So uh, just know that like a lot of those bodies, a lot of what you see out there is not sustainable. Yeah. It's good for that period of time. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Um, a poem? <laughs> How about a rap? <laughs> I, 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 surprisingly, I don't rap. Oh. Um, I know, that's shocking. Well, I guess um, we don't need to do this interview. <laughs> <laughs> I was under the rap impression star, that you were a rap started. star. Um, oh. No, just, I just want to commend you for uh, using 
you know, they ask that so you would say but that. no but like there is that sort of um, in the play Burn This you know mm-hmm. like Lanford Wilson mm-hmm. writes and I'll get this quote wrong the same as I got Lord Byron's right. quote wrong but it's like you want to write something that's so personal that you want to scroll Burn This on the cover and you did that with the show like you are doing that with the show and I think whenever you start with the truth mm-hmm. Like, there's no mystery about why this show has succeeded and found an audience. It's because you started with the truth. People know when they're being lied to. People know when they're being manipulated. You are telling the truth. And and that's a hard thing to do when you come from a place of eating disorder. So I would just say, you're doing really good. Aww. Right back at you. She's amazing. He's amazing. She's amazing. He's amazing. I'm just okay. Well. Yeah. No, he's amazing. <laughs> Is there anything that you want to say? No. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> I have frosting up my nose. She does. Because we did something earlier. You'll see it when we hit 35,000. So donate, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> that was so good. <laughs>